So I went to a boxing gym at the age of seven. Okay. And that was 28 years ago. Okay. And literally fell in love with the sport and I haven't looked back. Yeah, awesome. And I mean, I, I remember being at school and sitting at the back of the class and supposed to be doing an English assignment and I'd be with a boxing magazine. Okay. <laughs> you know, reading my boxing magazine with the file up on top so the teacher in the front couldn't see what I was doing. Yeah. So, 28 years ago and uh, my passion for the sport just grows and grows each year. I think the more success we have with the fighters and with the gym is, you know, my passion just keeps growing. I mean, obviously, I've had my fair share of losses over the years and it's, I'm going to lose again in the future. It's just part of sport and it's part of life. Yeah. you gotta, you got to either win or you got to lose. I boxed, I learned how to box when I was seven okay. and I had, I really wanted to fight, I really wanted to fight. Mm -hmm. But um, my mother always said to me, you know, you're a good Jewish boy and uh, <laughs> we sent you to a private school and, you know, like I resented her for it back yeah. then, but, you know, looking back, I don't know if I would have made it, to be honest, okay. you know, but, you know, and, and I actually come under a lot of criticism for that from my contemporaries. They, they feel because they all ex fighters and now they trainers. You know, yeah. you know, I've been called a pretender and I've been called a, a fake and I, just, I laugh at it because yeah. at the end of the day, you look at the, one of the two most successful trainers of all time, Ray Sol and Angelo Dundee, they didn't fight. They yeah. didn't get in the ring and fight competitively. I mean, Angelo boxed in the army a little bit, but he, he never, certainly never competed. And as for Ray Sol, probably the greatest trainer ever breathed, he never boxed. So, yeah. you know, you just got to understand the nuts and bolts of what we do and, 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 and the industry yeah. and have a good understanding of human nature. But, so I never fought competitively. I mean, I know, I know how to throw a jab and, and, and a cross, <laughs> but yeah. in terms of actually getting the, getting hits on the head competitively, it's never happened for me. And like I'm saying, looking back, I think probably it was the right decision. Yeah. You know? But, yeah, sometimes, a few years ago, I was thinking, maybe I should have wanted to amateur fights, but, <laughs> you know, there's more my ego speaking and stuff. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, you, know, I, you know, I can't do both. Yeah. Even back then when I wanted to, when I was toying with the idea years ago, because I'd opened the gym 13 years ago, and I was thinking, you know, maybe I should just have a few fights and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, you can't, you can't be a fighter and a coach. It just, right. you, you can't, because at the end of the day, being a coach is you teaching, and, and you can't be selfish. So you've got to have one or the other. When I was 16 years old, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I wanted to fight, you know, and uh, because I also did, Competitive judo. I was in I was in the Western Province judo team. I also won South African championships. I had close to three hundred amateur fights. So my wrestling and judo was very good, um, and I went overseas for judo for South Africa and stuff. And but boxing was always my first love. Yeah. And when I was sixteen, I had an option. I had two choices. One was to try for the provincial judo team or try for the provincial boxing team. Okay. My dad was okay with me doing the boxing. Obviously, and the judo, and my mother said, not the boxing, just the judo. So I made a choice. Yeah. Inevitably, it was up to me, and I chose judo that year, but also I had a history in the judo, judo ranks and stuff, and I, I actually ended up winning essays that year. So, and then after that, I thought to myself, that was in July. I mean, it's like, it's crazy how long ago it was. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'd always watch fights on TV, and, and I always watch the cornermen and the trainers and stuff. And then when I was 16, the one, the one weekend, I went, walked in and the trainer was pretty old where the gym I was training at was the Seapoint Boxing Gym. And I just put on the mitts. I started working with the fighters and catching catching on the mitts for the guys and I loved it. Yeah. Well, that was kind of the next thing, you know, if, if I couldn't fight competitively, um, let me at least stay involved in the sport and get, you know, you know. And it, it was way before that, actually, when my late father was involved in the sport, and um, he was a cut man. So I went to my first boxing show when I was seven, 1985, and when I was 10 years old, I started tagging behind my dad in the corner. Okay. So the late Marcus Temple, show me, died last year, 2012. Um, he kept chasing me away, but then he said to my dad one, one year, he said, there's no legal limits, age limit, at that stage before the act was re rewritten of the age group a cornerman could be in. Okay. So at the age of 12, I applied for my seconds license okay. and I got it. So that in itself is probably a record in South Africa. I think actually the world, the youngest <laughs> second in, in like you know, 12 years old. 
and I do bucket duties. I was just happy to be in the corner, you know, just yeah. happy to be close and start yelling instructions. I didn't know what the fuck I was saying probably, but <laughs> the reality was I was still there and uh, I was, you know, I was involved in it and um, so from a young age and then, you know, I was training obviously the boxing gyms and you know, I thought I could box back then. Maybe I couldn't, I don't know. And then when I was 16, I made that choice and I started holding mitts for guys and stuff. And then, um, yeah, it just kind of came second nature and I just loved it. And then 